good evening and thank you very much for the introduction vinay so i will start off my talk called the silver nail which is about the secrets of bombay dockyards now mumbai as we all know gained prominence as a cotton trading and commercial center in the mid 19th century however hidden in the away in the history books is the fact that from 1736 to 1932 over 400 ships and vessels of various descriptions were built at the bombay dockyard added to that some 220 odd ships and vessels were built by the mascon dock ship builders from 1932 onwards taking the total of ships built at bombay well over 600 which is a singular achievement for any city or shipyard so Mumbai has always been associated with sea. It draws its very identity from the sea. Seen here is the crest of the Bombay Municipal Corporation, which depicts three ships, also the Gateway of India. And if you see this statue, which is there outside, uh, outside the Bombay Municipal Corporation headquarters, we have this lady holding a ship in her right hand. which is so it's in a way it is acknowledged that mumbai and the sea uh, sea the maritime activity are always closely interlinked and associated uh, during the course of the talk i will follow a timeline which will stretch from 1509 when the europeans first landed up at uh, the city of mumbai and take us up to 1830 with the launch of the first steam ships so during the course of the talk i will follow a flexible timeline wherein i will go to and forth between between time zones going front and back so please excuse me that and also i will be referring to the city of mumbai as bombay to be politically correct because that is what the city was known at that point in time So, if you are ready, ready, let's start. Anchors away, and here we go. So, the, to put things into perspective and give a bit of the background, a bulk of India's trade is through the sea and amounts to ninety percent of trade by volume and seventy percent by value. Value is through the sea and through the maritime routes. Now, India lies at a very central position of the Indian Ocean. it is at a pivotal point and is, as we all know it is indian ocean is the only ocean which is named after a country india has always had a rich maritime history which dates back to 4 millennia that is 4000 years of recorded history records the fact of india's trading and sea routes and various maritime activities in fact we have records i will just go over few of the references which are found in history on uh, india's uh, maritime activity one of them is the by the roman writer pliny the elder in the first century where he complains of a rising trade deficit with india because uh, women in rome had developed a fine taste for indian fabrics at that time now uh, the record, subject of indian shipping and ship building has been exhaustively chronicled by professor radha kumud mukherjee and his monumental work Indian shipping published in 1912 he records that ship building was an extensive industry in ancient india india traded with arabia africa egypt and even rome and indian built teak vessels went as far as mexico which is depicted on the map you see here records speak of a dry dock at lothal which is in modern day mangrol in gujarat dating to 2300 before common era we also have records of alexander the great when he invaded india he made full use of indians in building and building a large number of boats and vessels which he required for his passage and part of his army left india by sea around 325 before common era we have records of the 10th and 11th centuries where considerable maritime activity under the chola kings and according to professor mukhaji marco polo the italian adventurer has recorded interesting details regarding indian built ships and ship building activities in his memoirs marco polo of course was uh, lived around uh, the 13th century in the common era and lastly in his most recent book the era of darkness by shashi tharoor 
He has quoted the historian and economist Angus Madison in saying that in the year 1700, common era, India's share of world trade was 27%, which presupposes that India had large maritime fleet to conduct its trading activities. So this must this was just to set the context of India's historical maritime activity. Now, shipbuilding was a well-established industry on the west coast and east coast of India well before the Europeans arrived in the 15th century. Basin, which lies just north of Mumbai, was one of the oldest shipbuilding ports in India. And as far back as 1540, they built a large ship of 700 tons for the king of Portugal at Agashi in Basin. The Mughal emperors of Delhi had all their vessels built at Surat. It also recorded that ships of the Siddhis Navy, that is the Admiral of Aurangzeb, was built at Surat by orders of Aurangzeb. And traditional shipbuilding is still carried out at Baypur near Kodi Kod, that is Calicut, where shipbuilding was being carried out since medieval times and persists to this day in the traditional format. But what we are really interested in this talk is shipbuilding activities in the city of Mumbai or Bombay, as it was known there, and the Bombay Harbour. Now, this slide shows the seven islands of Mumbai or Bombay, and then how the city has reclaimed the space and evolved as a city of uh, Mumbai today, which is shown in brown. What is of interest? What is of interest is this particular area of the Bombay Harbour here. Now, why I will just tell you. So, this so another map shows the Bombay Harbour or the bay it is known here. And roughly to the eastern seaboard of the city, which extends from Gateway of India to about Wadala. Now, what attracted, what was attractive about this place was that it was a natural harbor. It was deep. It had a favorable tidal uh, range. It was protected from all three sides and shores were adaptable for landing of vessels for uh, repairs and careening of ships. Timber and raw material were cheaply and abundantly available from the hinterland. And Bombay was aloof from the hinterland. From mainland India, it was difficult to get at. So all these factors favored Bombay and to have made it attractive to the powers that be in around the 16th century. We have the record of the Portuguese Viceroy, Nano da Cunha. He selected uh, Bombay as a rendezvous for his expedition he commanded against Gujarat in 1531. He sailed from Goa, the Portuguese fleet, uh, fleet sailed from Goa on their way to Gujarat and they anchored in Bombay Harbour. And this was the record when the European vessels anchored at Bombay Harbour for the first time. So we had the record of a deep natural harbour. Now, where is this harbour? What is the bay? The main ship building and ship repair activity happened in the what is the area which is known as the bay. We see the bay here just outside the fort walls. And in today, uh, today what the bay lies part of the naval dockyard, which is shown in the satellite image. So shipbuilding mainly happened in this area and partly at Masgon. A bit of history. We all know under the Treaty of Marriage of 1661 between King Charles II and the Portuguese princess Infanta Catherine of Braganza, the King of Portugal ceded and granted the crown of England, the island and harbour of Bombay in full sovereignty. Hence, Bombay passed into English hands on 8th February 1665, when Humphrey Cook took possession of Bombay on behalf of the King of England and became the first governor of the island. It was, however, soon discovered that the government of Bombay cost more than it produced. And eventually on 27th March 1668, the island was transferred from the Crown to the East India Company at an annual rent of 10 pounds. What did the East India Company do? We'll call it the company for short. It established a trading post and settlement at Bombay. They built a castle and fortified the town. They extended an invitation for different communities to pursue business activities at Bombay. So Bombay, Bombay had then became a sort of a trading post, a settlement grew and grew from that point in onwards. Shown here are the extracts of a letter written by the second governor of Bombay, Gerald Ongier, who recognized the advantages of Bombay as a shipbuilding and ship repair 
uh, center. So he wrote to the governors, extolling the virtues of Bombay, where he says that ships of up to 400 tons will, can be hauled ashore for repairs, and a few uh, around 300 tons weight will be hauled ashore at Mascom. Now, this turn of uh, four, three tons, I will be using quite often. So I'll just uh, re uh, recap Archimedes' principle. The tons refers to the amount, the size of the ships. The ships are classified in various methods. One of them is the size of the ship or tonnage or the amount of water that they displace, which again acts as a buoyant force. We all know Archimedes' principle. So uh, it was found suitable that up to 400 tons of ship can be repaired here at Bombay Harbor. Which takes us to 1736, an important milestone date. The Bombay factors or the people in charge of the factory at Bombay write to the Surat factors that they needed the services of a good carpenter for a ship that they were intending to build at Bombay. In March 1736, Lauji, who was a foreman at the shipyard at Surat for the East India Company and 12 other carpenters arrived at Bombay on board the HCS Kawar and for which the Bombay Council account was debited by 300 rupees. Now, the Lauji reported to the head shipwright one Mr. Robert Baldry and starts working in the dockyard. In 1740, Mr. Robert Baldry suddenly dies due to uh, certain reasons and a ship called the Restoration was left incomplete. Mr. Lauji then started, stepped in and completed the work on the ship for which he got a gratuity of 200 rupees. And that is how Lauji started his career at the Bombay Dockyard. And since uh, 1740 onwards, he became the head shipwright. A shipwright is one who's engaged in the building and repair of ships. Now, the Parsis at that time did not use surnames, but use a combination of their names and their father's names. So, Lauji's full name was Lauji Nasarwanji or Lauji, son of Nasarwanji, who uh, became the head shipwright at the Bombay Dockyard in 1740. Wadia is a, is a name for a person engaged in carpentry and shipbuilding, but he did not adopt that name for some time. So Lauji started work at the Bombay Dockyard and soon his reputation traveled far and wide. And Bombay Dockyard was slowly flooded with orders. Around 1736 to 1764, Lauji is referred to as the master carpenter. And in 1764, he was referred to as the master builder. This shows the Bombay dockyard as it is, exists in the present day. Now, that this all this ship building activity required infrastructure. So, around 1749, uh, uh, we have a letter which appears in the Bombay public proceedings, which was written uh, where they recorded the need of constructing a dry dock. And approval was granted by the East India Company to consider uh, to construct a dry dock for helping in shipbuilding and ship repair activities. Thus, we had the Upper Old Bombay Dock was completed in July 1750, for which the rate of uh, docking in this dock was one rupees one fifty per ship. The Middle Old Bombay Dock came up in 1762. And the third dock, which is now known as the Lower Old Bombay Dock, was completed in 1765. Now, this was the docks which came up. And as you see, the Bombay Dock is still in use. It is part of the Naval Dockyard at uh, just outside, uh, inside the Lion Gate. In 1769, it was decided to build another dock at Masgon, which is a few kilometers north of the Bombay Dock and for it was built for a ship's about 300 tons burden and the first ship, uh, uh, the Mascon Dock constructed on a site where the mud slipway was believed to have existed in 1635 and we have references of Mascon Dock in various, um, various historical documents but Mascon Dock came up in 1774. Now, there is sufficient anecdotal evidence to uh, indicate that Mascon Dock functioned as a supplementary yard of the Bombay Dockyard. We have records in newspapers of that day which record ships being built at Mascon Dock. We have, as shown here, 
uh, extracts from the newspaper Bombay Courier, which records on 19th March 1808, 1st April 1832, and 13th February 1854. Launching of the HCS Thomas Grenville, the HCS Shannon, and the HCS Mount Stuart and on different ships at Mascom. Here, here we see the extracts of the Bombay Courier, which records the launch of the Thomas Grenville at Mascom. Mascom. So we have enough anecdotal evidence. Uh, this is the extract of the Naval and Military Gazette of 1834 reporting the appointment of one Commander Cogan as the boatmaster and captain of Mascom Dock. So we have enough anecdotal evidence to indicate that Mascon Dock functioned as a supplementary dock of the Bombay Dockyard. Next to come up, Bombay Dock of course grew by leaps and bounds and it, it was necessary to build additional infrastructure. And we have the Duncan Dock, the upper Duncan Dock was completed in 1807. And 1810, the lower Duncan Dock was completed, needless to say, that the Duncan Dock, as depicted in the slide, is still in use by modern day warships. Now, what, what sort of activity took place in the docks? Of course, ships were built in the dry docks, but also ship repair and uh, tending to ships also happened in the dockyards. And one particular practice of uh, which was prevalent on the wooden hulls in those days was called tsunami. Now, because of the tropical waters in, in and around the Indian subcontinent, uh, the wooden hulls were inflicted by a worm, a bore worm called Torredo Navatis, which drilled hold, holes into the wooden hulls. Uh, it, the ships had to be docked for repair because they used to compromise the watertight integrity of the ships. So there used to be a process called chunam, where chunam or lime was mixed with Ginelli oil and gum sandrak, which is a type of resin. And they used to make a mixture which to be applied on the wooden hulls. And after it dried, the wooden cloth, it became very hard and prevented this uh, worm from boring holes into the ship. So this type of wooden main, uh, maintenance activities happened in the dockyard, which led to the shipbuilding activities taking off over a period of time. And we come to now move on to 1736, where the first ship to be built, uh, in, as per the records, was the HCS at Drake. HCS stands for the Honorable Company Service, uh, which was built at Bombay Dock. It was a schooner carrying 14 guns. The type of uh, 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 type of ships I've told you it displaced 140 tons, and it was uh, mainly favored for pilot vessels. These type of ships were used for pilot vessels. Now we'll have a look at some other type of ships that were built at the Bombay Dockyard. In uh, 17... I, yes? Sorry, sir. I, uh, there was just a request from some of the participants. We could speak a little slowly. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you. So we have the HCS Grab, uh, HCS Success, Honorable Company Ship Success, which was built. It was a grab a type of ship called Grab. It was built in 1736 and it displaced 140 tons. It was a modified design of the Gurab, which was the indigenous design on Vogue in those days. And also uh, different types. I'm just covering the different types of vessels that the Bombay Dockyard started building since 1736. So we have the Gurab. We have an uh, indigenous design called the Galbat. These were indigenous designs, but few of these ships were built at the Bombay Dockyard. We have a type of ship which was the frigate, which was a multi-purpose ship and the predecessor of the modern warship. These ships carried uh, square rigging on three masts and they, they were primarily deployed for patrolling and escort rescue, escorting the merchant ships. Frigates typically carried the armament in 24 to 48 guns on a single deck. And the first frigate to be built at the Bombay Dockyard was in 1793. What was the HCS Bombay, which displaced around 639 tons. Of course, many other ships we were also built, which we will cover soon. Another type of ship was a clipper. It was a very fast ship, had multiple masts, and you can see it had lots and lots of sails. And this type of ship was designed to carry bulk cargo. 
and primarily meant for trade. Two clippers were built at the Bombay dockyard in the uh, in the 19th century and primarily used for trade by the company. Company by company, I mean the East India Company. We look go on to another type of ship, which is called a snow. It carried two masts and a small snow mast. These were largely merchant ships and saw some war service also and built for the Bengal pilot service. Another type of ship that was built at the Bombay dockyard was known as the sloop. It was basically a man of war or warship, slightly smaller than the uh, frigate. But between uh, 1740 and 1850, some 30-odd sloops were built at the Bombay dockyard, mainly for the Royal Navy, the company, company, company I mean the East India Company and the Bengal Pilot Service. We have another type of vessel called the brig. The brigs were fast and maneuverable vessels built both as warships and for merchant ships and were highly popular in the 17th and 18th century and a number of them were built at the Bombay dockyard. So we have seen various types of ships that were built off. I've just covered some of them. There were many other different types of ships also built, but these are the main designs that were built at the Bombay dockyard. Now, who were the clients? Who did the Bombay dockyard build the ships for? It was the Bombay Marine, that is the predecessor of the Indian Navy. So they had a protection force, the Bombay Marine. Of course, they built it for the East India Company, the Madras Presidency, the Calcutta Presidency, the Bengal Pilot Service. They built ships for the private merchants. They built some ships for two ships for the Viceroy of Goa, which was a Portuguese power at that time. They built some ships for the Imam of Muscat, which is a friendly naval power. And of course, they built ships for the British Admiralty, that is the Royal, Royal Navy, as it is better known. Now, from the period 1736 to 1799, that is the 18th century, 112 ships of various descriptions were built at the Bombay dockyard. In the 19th century, that is from the period from 1800 to 1899, 262, the total of 363 ships were built, built at the Bombay dockyard. So, make in India was very much in practice in Bombay since 1736. Many more ships were built after that and continue to be built to this day. Now, we have seen uh, uh, the classification of ship. One was the tonnage of ships or the size of the ship. Another way of classifying the ships, uh, the warships that were built at Bombay was the rating of ships. Now, this varied from the first trade ships to the sixth trade ships. The first trade ship was the biggest, the baddest warship of that era. The first trade ship typically carried 120 guns or cannons on three decks. And the sixth trade ship went up to 20 guns. It was a smaller ship. So they ranged from 120 guns to second rate ships who carried typically 90 guns, third rate ship would carry somewhere around 74 guns, and go on, so on and so forth, up to the sixth rate ship. So a third rate is typically what would not be such a bad thing. It was somewhere middle of the scale, uh, middle of the scale for the line of ships that, uh, that were built then. Which brings us to another term, the ships of the line. So the tactic in those days uh, between the opposing navies was the ships, the bad, uh, ships would line up in a line as shown in the slide against each other and let each other have a broadside and fire at either and whichever uh, fleet was uh, left standing was usually the winner. So the ships of the line were the biggest, the baddest warship of that era. And the rule was that the ships of the line were usually built of English oak and they were usually built in Britain. So Britain did not permit the building of ships of the line outside Britain in the mid uh, 18th century. Now, in the first phase of shipbuilding at Bombay, the emphasis had been on repairs and construction of small ships. But things gradually changed because of certain events that happened around 1770 and 1770, around 1770. There was a shortage of oak timber in England. Now, ships of the line were usually built only of oak. 
So in 1772, the East India Company, which was mainly used, used to build ships at Bombay, was told that they could no longer build ships in England and no longer build ships of oak because they were required for the British Navy. So they were forced, they had to look for uh, elsewhere to build ships. Uh, um, they were, however, permitted to build ships in their colonies wherever they could find wood to build the ships. So that is why the focus shifted from building ships oak to an alternate which was Malabar tea. Now, as shown in the slide, approximately it would take uh, 4,500 tons of wood to build a 76 gun warship which would be of the third grade. Approximately 3,000 trees would be required to build a medium sized ship. So where do you source the wood from? There was a shortage of oak. So the uh, alternate emerged in the form of Malabar teak, which was plentifully available in India, in the forests of India. Also, Malabar teak later emerged to be superior to English oak because oak uh, had a sort of a lignic acid, which used to corrode the joiners, the nails, uh, the various metallic joiners that were used is to corrode that which did not exist in Malabar tea. Also, the life of Malabar tea ship was typically 50 to 60 years compared to around 25 years of English oak. And uh, the cost, of course, was much cheaper. It is to cost 15 pounds to the ton compared to an oak ship, which is to cost around 17 to 18 pounds uh, per ton. So there were lots of things favoring uh, using a Malabar teak as a raw material for building of ships in for, for the East India Company. However, the ship builders in Britain were not very impressed by these arguments. Their main concern was loss of business. So as a sop to them, the British Parliament ordered that the crew and the captain of an Indian ship should be Englishmen. So they placed certain restrictions on ships being in order to curb the shipbuilding activity in India. So first was the crew and the captain had to be Englishmen. Then the British Indian government chipped in by levying a duty of 15% on goods imported into India on India built ships, whereas the duty on uh, goods imported on British built ships was only 7.5%. So all sort of trade barriers were put. In addition, that only another rule that was put was that British only British built ships could import goods from south and east of Cape of Good Hope into Britain. So that put a uh, big restriction on ships being employed for uh, importing goods into England. So these were the restrictions on trade practices that were employed. However, we come to the year 1800, an important turning point in the history of shipbuilding at Bombay, when large ships began to be built here. The first ship to be built here was the HCS Marquis Convalis, which was a ship displacing uh, around 1400 tons and carrying 56 guns, which was completed and launched in eight, the year 1800. Now, on her arrival in England, she evoked praise from all naval authorities and attracted a lot of attention. The Lords of the Admiralty, I mean the Royal Navy, decided to purchase the ship and rename it the HMS Akbar in 1804. So this was the first example of a ship built at Bombay, uh, finding service with the Royal Navy, the British Navy at that time. This slide shows the plans of the Royal Navy and the ship HMS Akbar. Now, in the early part of the 19th century, Britain was perpetually at war with various European powers and there was a huge shortage of warships due to the Napoleonic Wars. So in the early part of the 19th century, the Bombay Dockyard was asked to build a ship of the line and a frigate as an experiment. We have seen what a ship of the line is and a frigate is a different type of a ship. They were asked to build these ships as an experiment and the HMS Salset was the first ship to be built for the Royal Navy. It was a ship of the fifth grade and th carried 36 guns. It was launched on 24th March 1807. This was the first ship to be built of teak for the Royal Navy and not of oak. And the first ship to be built at Bombay to the order of the Royal Navy. Which brings us to the second ship, which was the HMS Minden. 
एच एम एस मिंडन वॉज अ सेवेंटी फोर गन शिप ऑफ द थर्ड ग्रेड एंड इट वॉज अ शिप ऑफ द लाइन टू बी बिल्ड फॉर द रॉयल नेवी द फर्स्ट शिप ऑफ द लाइन वी हैव सीन वॉट शिप ऑफ द लाइन इज इट वॉज द फर्स्ट शिप अ मेजर वॉर शिप टू बी बिल्ड फॉर द रॉयल नेवी एट बॉम्बे एंड द फर्स्ट मेजर वॉर शिप टू बी बिल्ड ऑफ टीक इंस्टेड ऑफ ओक we have an extract of the bombay courier dated 23rd june 1810 it was the times of india of that era which describes the launching ceremony of the hms mindan our uh, again once again make in india was very much prevalent in those time in also now what is mindan's claim to fame other than being the first ship of the line to be built at bomb uh, outside of england Hms Minden saw service in the American War of 1812 between, which was fought between Britain and America. During the war, a young American lawyer named Francis Scott Key was sent abroad on board the Hms Minden, which was harboured in uh, Chesapeake Bay, to negotiate the release of a friend captured by the British after the defeat of the U.S. forces in Maryland. Key was detained overnight on the ship while the British attacked Baltimore. at daybreak in spite by seeing the american flying flag flying high over fort mchenry he scribbled a poem this later became the star spangled banner which is now the national anthem of the united states of america minden saw service in various theaters finally in chilkil she was broken up in 1861 we have a first day cover here which shows the minden which shows francis scott key and also depicts the minden let's move on and see some other ships which were built at bombay dockyard we have the hms cornwallis which was a 74 gun ship of the third rate and ship of the line to be built at for the royal navy she was launched on 2nd may 1813 at bombay and commissioned at 14 uh, on 14 november 1814 at portsmouth Now HMS claim to fame was on 27th April 1815 she was engaged the American sloop USS Hornet in the American war unknown to HMS Cornwallis the captain of the Cornwallis the war had already ended but since the Cornwallis was sailing he did not know that and he continued to engage the American ship uh, at sea even after the war had ended but Cornwallis fame to uh, claim to fame is signing of the treaty of Nanking after china's defeat in the first opium war representatives which were on the british and the chinese empires negotiated a peace treaty on board the hms cornwallis which was which is known as the treaty of nanking which was signed on 29th august 1842 on board the hms cornwallis now the important point to note that this treaty ceded hong kong island to the british as well as opening of various ports to trade and paying over 20 million in silver in uh, this is cornwallis's claim to fame let's look at some other ships that were built at the bombay dockyard we have the hms asia which was a second rate ship of the line which was launched at bombay in 17 jan in 1824 she displaced almost 2300 tons and was a ship of the second rate what was hms asia's claim to fame HMS Asia was uh, uh, participated as in the last major naval battle in history to be fought entirely with sailing ships this was the battle of navarino which was fought on 20th october in 1827 this was the last battle fought entirely with sailing ships we have the hms ganges or hms ganga it is known now which was an 84 gun grade uh, ship of the second grade and ship of the line for the royal navy launched in 1821 she's she is notable for having been the last sailing ship to be uh, serve as a flagship a flagship is the ship on which the admiral uh, embarks and controls the rest of the fleet and she saw action uh, in many theaters she also hms ganga saw a century of service she was in service till 1929 so you can imagine 100 and almost 108 years of service for a wooden built ship which brings us to hms trincomalee 
which is one of the which is the second oldest floating ship in the world she was launched at bombay on 12th october 1817 so hms trincoli trincomali was a leda class frigate carried 46 tons uh, frigate of the fifth rate and displacing around 1450 tons she is on display at hartlepool in the united kingdom so anybody visiting the united kingdom i would urge you to visit the hms trincomali which is a bombay built ship now we have an interesting anecdote regarding uh, one of uh, britain's greatest uh, naval heroes admiral horatio nelson who fought uh, at the battle of trafalgar now it is recorded by gillian tindall that admiral horatio nelson when he was a midshipman of around 13 or 14 years age was was posted on a ship called the hms seahorse which was stationed somewhere in the east indies and she docked at bombay for repairs now uh, there is uh, hms seahorse also figures in another chapter in the bombay dockyard history the first labor dispute HMS Seahorse was undergoing repairs at the Bombay dockyard sometime in 1781. Two British officers of that ship suspected a workman of stealing some items and had him publicly flogged on board ship. This caused a big commotion and the rest the rest of the tradesmen who were working on that ship resort to a two long strike and walk out of the ship. They report the matter to the master builder who goes on board but he is also assault, assaulted by the British officers. which resulted in the entire dockyard resorting to a strike and work stop in the dockyard till finally peace was restored by the admiral of the royal squadron and so this was the first after which the workers re, uh, re, returned and resumed work on the ship so this was probably the first recorded instance of a labor dispute at bombay dockyard now let's come and have a look at the various stages of ship building ship building activity always begins with the design of the ship design are made by naval architects and involve a lot of calculations and drawings these are the deck plans of the hms ganges which have been which are kept at the royal maritime museum at greenwich now once the ship is designed on paper uh, the design on the basic big side shape of the ship uh, the master uh, the model of the ship is made with the number of uh, as shown in the diagram which then then once this model is approved by the ship builder and the designer and the person who has commissioned the ship the actual ship building activity starts with the laying of the keel now the keel you see the person standing in the slide holding on to a wooden uh, plank is the main backbone of the ship which provides the most longitudinal strength of the ship the ship is uh, the keel laying is an important activity and once the keel is laid the ribs of the ship are put in plane or the frames as they are known they are made of curved timbers so so a basic skeleton of the ship is built up by the keel and the frames once this is being done then the next part of the ship building is the planking where the intermediate gaps between the uh, keel and the frames are plank clamp planks are put there and the skin of the ship is uh, formed so we have a basic hull of the ship being formed at this stage then the mast the yard arms the various other uh, various other parts of the sh uh, ship goes in once this is uh, once this is done we have the ship uh, ship is constructed and then it is launched into the water for the fir first time so we had a very interesting ceremony in those days which was known as the silver nail ceremony and mark the commencement of ship building this was observed by the builders who were parsi builders and they observed this ceremony so we had a silver nail of about 8 inches which was engraved with the name of the ship the name of the builder and the name of the uh, person who was the chief guest at the ceremony and this uh, nail was uh, the ceremony was usually presided over by a parsi priest who would keep the nail within his possession lots of frankincense and would be the nail would be kept over that and then it would be hammered into the keel 
by the hand of a lady, usually the wife of the chief guest. And then in turn, the, the dignitaries present would hammer the silver nail into the keel of the ship. Thereafter, verses from the uh, Quran would be recited because the large workforce would be, uh, would be Muslim in, uh, and the Bandar, Laskar or the other workmen in the dockyard would be Hindu. So a lot of verses from uh, various religions would be recited at this ceremony. Sweet meats would be distributed, rose water would be sprinkled and presentations of shawls and other gifts would be given to the builders. So this was a multicultural, multi-religious affair which used to take place at that time, point in time. Coming to the origins of the figures, those ships, if you see in those days, used to have a figurehead at the uh, front of the ship at the bow of the ship to uh, it was believed in those days that the ships were living beings and they believed that the ship needed eyes to find its way this was just a belief of illiterate sailors of that day so figurehead embodied the spirit of the ship and believed to placate the gods of the sea to ensure a safe passage for the ship Almost every prow had a card figure, and if you see all ship had they had very large eyes as if to find the way for the ship. And it was also a means for the sailors. The sailors usually were illiterate, and there would be dozens of ships anchored in any harbor. So they needed a method to find their ship and not land up in on some different ship. So this figure eight used to help the sailors identify their ship and used to relate in some manner to the name of the ship. So we have the figureheads of Asia, we have the figureheads of the HMS Seringapatnam, which was modeled on Tipu Sultan. Some other figureheads of the ships of the day, we have the HMS Calcutta, HMS Ganges, HMS Madagascar, HMS U Lindsay. Or if you see, note, all of them have got wide eyes, which was believed for the ship to see. Which brings us to another interesting chapter in shipbuilding. Now, Jamsed Ji Boman, you see the gentleman on the right hand side, was the grandson of Laoji, the first uh, famous shipbuilder which we have seen previously. And he was responsible for conducting, constructing almost 80 ships, um, very, very famous ships he built. Among them were the Convalis, the Minden, the Trinko Mali, which we have seen so far. Now, Black fellow was a term used by the Europeans to refer to the Indians. It was a very, very degradatory term. So what Jamsadji Bomanji did while he was constructing the ship Marki Cornwallis, which we have seen earlier on, he one, one day went and carved on the keel of the ship. This ship built was built by a damn black fellow, AD 1800. And many, many years later, when the ship came to Bombay for repairs, he pointed it out. Of course, he was a very senior person by that time. But the interesting story is the figurehead we have seen of the HMS Trincomalee was is rumored to be, have been modeled on Jamsedji Pomanji, who is shown on the right hand side. So the his, history of shipbuilding in India cannot be complete without recording the contribution of the first family of shipbuilding, the Wadiyas. Right from the Laoji we have seen, who came to Bombay in 1735, the seven generations of Wadiyas performed the task of the master builder, the assistant builder, the second, second assistant builder, right up to 1885, a period of 150 years. And uh, the term Wadia was uh, thought to be used for the first time in 1764, which means master builder. Otherwise, the uh, fashion in earlier to that was using a combination of yours and your father's name. So we have a long list of Wadias. Uh, we have this slide shows the Wadias and their tenors as master builders at the Bombay dockyard. Now, this activity brought lots of fame and rich uh, uh, wealth to the Wadias. And in the fashion of that Europe of day, the European aristocratic families, the Wadias had their own family crest, which is shown in the slide here. You can see it depicts a ship and the seven stars probably represent the seven islands of Bombay. They also had a palatial house called the Laoji Castle, which no longer exists, but it was, it, it was uh, existing at Parel. 
Wadiyas also built an Atash Bairam. Atash Bairam is the highest grade of a Parsi fire tunnel. The Wadiya Atash Bairam is located in marine lines. And just for the record, there are only four Atash Bairams in Mumbai and only nine in the world. So the Wadiya Atash Bairam is located in marine lines opposite the Parsi dairy farm. Now this Atash Bairam has got some very interesting artifacts which is kept there. The, of course, the honors, because of the large number of ships that, the, that were built at the Bombay dockyard and the Parsi, by the Parsi master builders, they were honored on a number of occasions by the, by the British East India Company and later on by the British Crown. So a silver scale was presented to Lauji in 1772. This slide shows the silver scale. It is kept there in the Atash Shahram, which I have just referred to. In, uh, in uh, now also a uh, silver scale was presented to Bomanji Lauji, who was the second joint master builder. He was presented with this silver scale, which is also kept there. Now, in addition to this silver scale, he was granted an Inam grant of land at Parel, probably where the Lauji castle was constructed. He was granted land there. Now, here we see a brass yardstick which was presented to Nauroji Jamshedji, the fourth master builder. He was he was presented uh, this mass, uh, this brass scale and also a uh, inam grant of land in the villages of Ju and Vile Parle were presented to him in 1849 to Nauraji Jamshedji and his two brothers. And finally, just to put things in perspective, the last master builder was uh, uh, Jamshedji Dunji boy. Uh, he was conferred the title of Khan Bahadur and uh, he was presented, it is recorded by in the book, the Wadia Master Builders and Bombay Dockyard by one of their descendants. And he was presented 300 acres of land in the city of Mumbai for uh, their services rendered to the uh, Crown and the East India Company. So, which brings us finally uh, to the era of sale, finally ended when with the invention of the steam engines. They started to propel ships somewhere around the uh, 1830s. And the first ship of this type to be built at Bombay was the Yu Lindsay, which was built in 1829. She was a ship which displaced uh, around and powered by two engines. Now, this uh, with this, uh, this of course slide does not show the Yu Lindsay. It shows the uh, XCS Semiramis, which was built in 1841. But this sort of signaled the decline of the era of sail and shifted to the era of steel. Now there was at that point the Cape route. Before 1930, the primary route from England to India involved uh, almost a six-month passage from England around the Cape of Good Hope to. India and it was all subject to various conditions, weather conditions, prevailing winds, the ship design, tides. It was very, very subject. What the what happened was in 1831 the company fired the overland route. That means going from Bombay through the Gulf overland through Egypt. Now this once the steamship started flying this route, it covered this distance in 21 days from Bombay to, uh, uh, to the, through the Gulf of Aden to Alexandra and to Suez, and then through the Mediterranean on to England. So her journey of around six months reduced by half, it came down to three months. So here it shows in comparison the, the Cape route and the overland route, and this sort of signaled the, along with the advances in technology, the steam engine signaled the end or decline of the sail ships and the steam power ship. So this, of course, did not happen immediately, but over a period of time, the era of sail ended with, and the era of steam began because of uh, various improvements in the steam engine. Now, we've come to uh, uh, some uh, matters of interest which I would like to cover, and certain expressions in have uh, come into the in English language from the uh, era of sail or sail ships. We shall cover them one by one. Uh, if you can figure out or you can guess which expression, uh, which expression I'm referring to, I would urge you to write it down in the uh, in the uh, in the uh, notes box below. 
so we have we have uh, this expression which which is true every sail ship used to have miles and miles of cordage and rigging because you needed to pull a certain uh, uh, certain rope for the sail to behave in a particular way which gives rise to the to the term learning the ropes so you had to know which rope you had to pull to for a certain sail to behave in a particular fashion and the only uh, way to know it was to learn the ropes so when you joined the sail ship you had to first learn the ropes of course this term has come into the common english usage and what is of interest is if you see if you see uh, this old map of bombay which shows a road called the rope walk uh, rope walk which is now presently the k dubash mark where the Uh, Kala Ghoda festival takes place. So here was the place where the ropes used to be made for use on board the sailing ships of war. Coming on to the next expression, we have. If you can figure out what is this uh, expression, so this uh, when uh, when old ships of those days were unsure or. unsure of their position in coastal waters ships would release a caged crow and the crow would fly towards the nearest land thus giving some the vessel some sort of a navigation fix and we have the term as the crow flies meaning the crow going in a straight uh, in a straight line so we had also a, a part of the ship which was known as the crow's nest which used to be a lookout used to be positioned on the on the top of the looking looking out now we have another term which which has arisen from uh, uh, can anybody guess what is this term so this is a very common term which is come into the english language because of sail ships the cat is out of the bag in the royal navy the punishment in those days was flogging so uh, it was uh, uh, the uh, errant sailors were whipped now the whip that were they used was called the cat of nine tails so it is to be kept in a bag a leather bag so that the sailors did not know who was going to get punished but seeing the cat out of the bag was very bad news indeed for the sailors we have another term from ship building activity uh, if you can figure out you can put it in the uh, remarks column this is called Uh, something meaning chock a block meaning filled to capacity or overloaded so in this a uh, lot of the ships had the rigging had lot of these chocks and blocks so if they were pulled to their uh, tightest uh, capacity it is a chock a block now this term has also found common use in the english language another another term which has come into the english language is can anybody guess from uh, this side yes it is called uh, a square meal so in, uh, the sailors on board the ships were served their meals in square plates so a square meal is known as a wholesome meal so another term which i'm coming to which was in common parlance which is come to common parlance is by and large by and large means when a seal when a ship is sailing by the wind it is it means into the wind and large when the wind is behind the sails so by and large generally means under all conditions can anybody guess what is this term i am referring to so this part of the ship is known as the poop deck from where the ship was uh, steered the poop deck is the to be pooped is to be swamped by flying so now the uh, the sailors used to be here used to be fog frequently swamped by the seas and they used to be pooped so this term has also come into the english language and lastly we have this term uh, can anybody guess what this term is referring to the, the, all the all the ships of that era carried a ship's bell and to this day even modern warships carry a ship's bell in those days a ship's bell used to indicate the time on board the ships so regulate the due daily routine of the ship a ship's bell would be rung every half an hour for four hour watches and this were marked by a 30 minutes hour glass so when eight bells toll would usually mean that it was the end of your duty period the end of your watch and you could then go and relax till your watch was again
8 bells also euphemically refers to the passing away of a sailor. We have this. So when 8 bells appears in an obituary, it still appears in obituaries. That means the sailor watches over or he has he's finished or he has passed away. Also, it leads to another term which is in common usage. Uh, it, it is in common usage is bringing out the year. So a, a particular custom that used to be fo followed was at the end of uh, uh, 12 o'clock midnight on 31st December. Eight bells used to be rung or bell used to be rung eight times for the passing of the new year and eight times again for the welcoming of the year. So we had the, we had at midnight on 31st December every year, a bell rung 16 times, which gives rise to the phrase bring in the new year. Now, with this, I have um, with this I have reached uh, the end of my talk, and I would uh, I would like to uh, call it eight bells for this talk. I would like to thank everybody for your patient listening to this, and all this is captured in uh, a maritime heritage gallery, which is there at Darohar, which is known as Darohar and Masgon Dock Shipbuilders Limited. This uh, slide shows some uh, some of the image of that. It captures the history of shipbuilding right from fifteen, uh, right from uh, the time when the Portuguese landed at Bombay, right up to the present day. So this uh, shows some images of the ships, uh, and this was the research and curatorial team, whom I would like to thank, which put together this, uh, which put together this heritage gallery, and all under the guidance of. Uh, Admiral Rear Admiral Rahul Kumar Shrawar and Commodore Rakesh Anand. Inauguration of the rover was done by the Honorable Defense Minister Mr. Manohar Parikar, and then later the upgraded version was inaugurated by the Honorable Defense Minister Sri Rajnath Singh. And I would also like to acknowledge various uh, institutions who have contributed in this in this talk and setting up of this heritage museum. And I would. Um, invite all of you if time permits and the authorities permit to visit this museum Darohar. I have uh, uh, finished and I now would like to take uh, questions if any. Great. Uh, thank, thank you so much Ninard for that amazing talk. Uh, we have had uh, loads of questions come in uh, from uh, our participants as well. So let's start off. Uh, the first question is from Indrashil Rao. Uh, he wants to know a little bit more about the Fatimar type of cargo ship and were these built by the Bombay dock Dockyard as well? So the Fatimar, uh, sir, uh, was, um, was an indigenous design. But uh, to my record, uh, we have a record of all ships built at the Bombay Dockyard. Fatimar does not figure in that list, but they may have built unofficially, but in the record, sir, these ships, uh, uh, sir would of course know he was headed the Bombay Bombay dockyard, but to the official records do not indicate the building of the ship, sir. Okay. No, I just wanted to mention that we have started the Maritime Mumbai Museum Society and uh, the logo is based on the Fatimar uh, as a uh, important uh, heritage uh, idea. And these were indigenous ships, sir, uh, probably used by the indigenous. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rao. We'll move on to the next question. Uh, this is from Nazni. Uh, would you please enlighten us a bit on the indigenous ships uh, Gurab and Galiwat and uh, their origin? So they were... Uh, they were in service by the local indigenous population. The uh, you might have heard of the uh, Ang Angres. So the local indigenous, the Maratha power, used to use these ships, and they were of indigenous design. Uh, only we have only a few records. Only two or three sh three ships of this design were built at the Bombay Docket, but they were mainly built by the local powers. Here we have covered in this talk the. The Bombay Dockyard, only two or three ships of this design were, but they were of local built for Indian by Indian shipbuilders across the country. So it was an Indian design. Yeah, and uh, in fact, just an adding point to uh, uh, that, there was another question about 
knowing a little bit more about ship building of Shivaji Maharaj and the Siddhis of Janjira. Okay, so this talk was restricted to the ship building activities in uh, Bombay Dockyard. So for that, probably you'll have to schedule another talk and uh, we'll come around to that uh, in that talk. Because the topic is too large to cover in uh, one hour. Uh, question related to the Wadias, uh, which was the last ever ship built by the Wadia master builders and in which year? Uh, so the builders, I said the seventh builder was uh, in action till uh, uh, 1884. But for that, I will have to refer to the list. I have a list of all ships built right up to the 20th century, but I will revert to you and then you can do that. From that, it is too vast a list, more than 400, 600 ships are built, but uh, uh, I will get back to you on this. So, uh, uh, adding point to the Wadia family, uh, question from Kanish that apart from the Wadias, were there any other shipbuilders in Bombay or was it limited to a particular community or a religion? So the shipbuilding was uh, uh, primarily carried out at the Bombay Dockyard. So the organization of the institution was the Bombay Dockyard. The Wadias were the shipbuilders who were employed by the Bombay Dockyard to build ships. So they would they were just the head builders they were of course if you had to build at so many ships there would be a vast uh, staff on the rolls of the bombay dockyard to get built and not all of them would have been wadias wadias were the head builders or the chief designers or the chief naval architects but there would have been many many others also and uh... Another question that's come in regarding the Wadias is that any reason why shipbuilding suddenly was stopped by the Wadias? No, uh, shipbuilding did not suddenly stop by the Wadias. The line of master builders sort of ended with the seven builders and then uh, there were other political uh, uh, and they sort of diversified into other activities. But shipbuilding per se continued and continues till this day at uh, Masgondok Shipbuilders Limited. So shipbuilding has not stopped since 1735. It continues till then and one of the oldest industries in Mumbai, which is not very well known and that was the objective of the stock. So it continues in its current forms. The forms of the ships have changed from wooden hulls to now modern day warships, which are built at the Masgondok Shipbuilders. So, Chandrasekhar Nene is asking, are the Bombay dying Wadia same as the shipbuilders and if so, what's the connection? So, the family tree starts with Lauji as per our records and one of the branch of the tree, it's a very distant branch, the direct descendants is one lady in France, she's in her 80s, whose direct traces a direct lineage to Lauji. But other than her, the, the Bombay Dai are one of a branch of that Wadia family. Yes, they are part of the family. And in the Heritage Museum that we have quoted, the entire family tree from Lauji is displayed there. So anybody can trace their lot of Wadia descendants come to trace their family tree. So, yeah, they are part of that family, but not the main branch. Um. Another question that comes from is what happened to the dockyard after 1885? How come metal ships weren't built here as much later on? So metal ships continued, uh, ships continued to be built. So somewhere between 1830 and now, uh, 1880, it transitioned. The shipbuilding technology went under a paradigm shift. And because of the machine coming, all the technological advances that happened, you had to shift over to a steel hull. So ships continued to be built. Gradually, the wooden, it was found that the wooden hulls could not take the stress of the boilers and the propellers and the heavy machinery. So they had to be replaced with steel machine. Ship building did not stop. It continues till this day at Mascon Dock Shipbuilders, which was again a part of the Bombay Docket, but now they're under different managements. Mascon Dock uh, was taken over by the government in uh, 1960 and then nationalized. So shipbuilding continues, but the forms of ships have changed, the methods of ships have changed, the technology of ships have changed. All right. Uh, there's a question that's coming from Mantra. Uh, how many ships were built in the Bombay dockyard and how many employees and how much time would it take to build a ship? 
So we, as I mentioned, uh, we have a record of about 600 plus ships built at Bombay since 1735. The record exists in 1735 right up to the present day. It could be well over 650 ships. So depending upon the complex, uh, the size of the ship, the complexity of the ships, the ship building in the present day takes anywhere between four to six years. So it depends upon the size of the ship and the complexity of the ship. All right. Uh, with respect to the English terms and terminologies, is there any connection to the word posh to shipbuilding or ships? Yes. So posh is not related to shipbuilding, but it refers to the uh, uh, passage India uh, when uh, people used to sail from uh, India to England. They would use a posh. The posh means port, outward bound, starboard, homeward bound. So it was referred to be on the port side, that is on the left hand side of the ship when you're sailing out of India because you would be less subject to the uh, elements. And when you return to India, you will be on the starboard side, that is on the um, right hand side facing front. So these are two sides of the ship, port and starboard. So posh arises from that. Outward port, outward bound, starboard, homeward bound. So that is how the term posh is. Okay, and I think uh, Chandrasekhar Nene wanted to ask the meaning of the terms bridge, starboard, and port. So bridge is the place from where the ship is controlled from. The captain or the officer of the watch usually is stationed on the bridge, and from there, let's say. The ship is steered. So the command and control of the ship is from the bridge, right? So, so that is a nautical term. Port and starboard. So we are looking at the uh, ship from back to front. The left hand side is referred to as the port side. So that was usually the ship, the port of the ship, the ship would be there. And the starboard, although it is the corruption of the word steer board, where the ship used to be steered from, is usually the right hand side of the ship facing forward from back to front. The port and starboard are the two sides. You can roughly translate it as the left hand side and the right hand side. But a sailor or nautical person will always refer to the port and starboard side. Uh, another question from Nazneen is, were the Muslim sailors exclusively from the Konkan area? A majority of them would be from the Konkan area. But uh, I would say not exclusively of them. They had a rich maritime tradition and they found employment at the dockyard and on the ships. So majority of them, yes, would be from the Konkan area. They would be uh, Marathi speaking or Konkani speaking uh, Muslims. And uh, you had mentioned that uh, uh, one of the Wadia shipbuilders had been given a plot of 300 acres. Uh, their suggestion is it was, was it Juhu or Vile Parle? I don't know. If so, it so they were given, they were given on three different occasions, like I mentioned. First was at Parel, second was at Ju and Vile Parle, and on third time, 300 acres were given. But that book which I referred to does not uh, indicate which part of Bombay, probably in the suburbs they would have been given, but that, I'm not clear about that. Uh, with respect to the shipbuilders, uh, the Wadias to be specific, did they work as contractors or were they on the rolls of the East India Company? I would say they were uh, employers, employees of the East India Company. Right. And, uh, did because they, they were paid. They were on the payroll of the East India Company. Right. And did they only own any docks themselves? See, this bought them into a large amount of money. They became extremely wealthy over a period of uh, two centuries. So I'm not aware of any docks that are owned by the Wadias in Mumbai at least. I do not know about outside now. Uh, another question to the English terms. Uh, what do you mean by to be pooped? So to be pooped, uh, like I mentioned, it was on the poop deck where it is to be swamped by water because water is to come on the deck. So to be pooped is to be tired, to be very, very exhausted. So that is uh, come from the term to be pooped because the uh, sailors used to be uh, stationed or do duty on the poop deck used to get swamped by water all the time because of the motion of the ship and they used to be very very tired by the end of their duty hours at the end of their watch. So there's a question that's coming from Kaivan that there's a shipbuilder in the town of Bilimora in Gujarat that still goes by the name Wadia. Is there any connection? 
most probably he would be a descendant of the family and i would urge kevan uh, uh, to see that family tree which uh, which is there in the darohar museum at masgondok he could probably trace that eh? but uh, he may be related because it was a family the family adopted that name uh, after a period of time we have seen how wadia originated so in fact that brings me to the next question where many are asking how can we visit the rohar so unfortunately this is uh, not open to the public but it is uh, uh, special permission has to be taken because masgon dock ship builders is a restricted area it comes under the ministry of defense however they do permit visitors so maybe uh, through khaki tours something can be arranged uh, after special permission has been okay and uh, does the masgon dock uh, ship builders build merchant ships or only naval ships they used to build merchant ships and in the 60s and 70s a number of merchant ships have been built at the masgon docks but now the order books are full of indian naval ships there are lots of ships and submarines and it is the only shipyard in india which builds submarines so right now they are only concentrating on uh, ships and submarines for the indian navy because of uh, capacity constraints and uh, is there any book or report which talks about the silver nail ceremony yes there is a book uh, which i quoted it is the uh, uh, bombay ship builder and wadia ship builders i quoted one book there so it talks of the silver nail ceremony i have a copy of that book it was published sometime in 1954 so if anybody is interested i can share that uh, book with you the book is titled the wadia ship builders right uh, another question from nazneen is were there any statutory specifications in ship building or were they international in nature sorry were sorry any, i'm not sorry uh, were there any statutory specifications in ship building or were they international in nature i think the statutory specification came in much later but uh, i'm not clear about the question what exactly uh, she wants to know can she probably rephrase that question and sure not maybe, under maybe she can rephrase it and send it to us again uh, parag is asking what happened to the wadias after 1886 and you know before nationalization came in uh, i think you had mentioned a little bit about how they then stop so they di- they diversified into various other activities so the Uh, there is a firm called Adeshir B Karsetji, which is still in existence, which is now into more of ship chandler activities, and they do the merchant shipping, uh, cargo related activities. So that uh, firm still exists. Wadias, of course, became immensely rich because of this and various other things, and then they diversified into other industries. Right. Okay, uh, I think that's all from our end. In case there are any other questions or any other comments, if any of the participants want to, uh, you know, mention. Uh, so Nazin has just clarified her point as well. It means basically regarding the dimensions of the ship, uh, capacity, weight, size. Uh, was this a matter of discretion of the ship builder, or were there any set rules? So it mainly dependent depended on the. order the person who places the order we have seen the different authorities used to place their order so we had uh, the royal navy placing the making their warships here we had the private merchants like jamshed ji ji boy and others who used to uh, build their cargo vessels here we had the imam of muscat we had various other powers used to build so they used to specify the role the dimension and also the budget of the ship so all these factors would have decided on what uh, what kind of ship would do so parag has a question with respect to indian ships were classified uh, by likes of d and v i'm not sure what he means by d and v over here but were the indian ships classified in a particular by any particular so the d and v is a classification of merchant ships which is prevalent in the present day so in the days also the ships there was a uh, there is an organization called lloyds of london which clearly classifies the merchant ships and it's a insurance agency and uh, concerned with shipping so there was a system of classification prevalent for merchant ships even in that day 
DNB is a much modern method of classification uh, for modern ships, but I doubt whether DNB existed in those days, but Lloyd's of uh, London definitely did. Okay, great. I think uh, that's all from the questions from here right now, Nenad. Uh, thank you so much once again for taking out the time for this talk, and I'm sure we'll be seeing you soon with your second presentation that takes on the legacy of ships from here onwards. Thank you very much. It was an honor and pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. And I would also like to thank all the participants for the patient hearing.